The focus this week is on visual literacy. Sometimes students are assigned to write a five or ten page paper on a five line poem or a really short story, and they complain that they can't write a five page paper on a five line poem. But understanding how to talk and write about art can understand how to talk and write about short literature as well. Um, as we look at the pictures in the textbook, we'll understand what things to consider and talk about in discussion or in writing. As always, I'm a fan of Bloom's Taxonomy, because especially if you're not used to looking at art and thinking critically about things like this, it helps you to go from the very basic level to the higher level of critical thinking. So that's what we're going to do, is go through the process of Bloom's Taxonomy. The knowledge level is like playing I Spy. In this picture, I see curtains, I see trees, clouds, it's a window, so I'm looking outside at the scenery. To understand what I'm looking at a little bit better, um, this is a painting, and yet I'm looking at a painting in the painting. You see the easel and the clip holding the canvas? So this is a painting of what's on the other side. So it's a painting of a painting. That's kind of fun, right? So in this painting of a painting, the artist is showing me what is on the other side of the window through the painting on the easel so that he can see, so that he can remember this, maybe. So this applies the painting inside the painting, applies to the painting outside of the painting, by showing us what's in the picture. Now, here's where we start to make it more interesting. Remember, analysis starts with asking questions. Why did he paint a painting of a painting? Why would he paint what's on the other side? Hmm. Some possible answers. Maybe what's on the other side is not really what's on the easel. Maybe he made it better. Or maybe he made it worse. Or maybe he's hiding something. The clouds and the hills and everything line up. But knowing how long it takes to paint something, that's not really possible. So is it a painting of time, perhaps? To demonstrate something about time? So how can we take this apart and put it back together to add some meaning? Now, putting information from other places together, this is not the only picture, the only painting by René Marguerite that you've seen this week. Remember, in the language of comics, you looked at the, the picture of the painting, or um, this is not a pipe. Same artist. And do they have some similar ideas? Putting them together... This artist has a strong interest in making you think a little deeper about what you're looking at. Is what you're looking at really what you're looking at? So in the, in the image of the pipe, with the writing under it that says this is not a pipe, you have to think a little bit more about how it's not a pipe, and if it's not a pipe, what is it? So could we apply the same thing to this painting? This is not a painting, or this is not scenery or nature. This is not a landscape. What is this? What are we looking at? Is there some deeper meaning hidden within this that the artist is trying to get across to us? Now, this is the best part. This is where we get to draw some conclusions and figure out what it all means based on the ideas that we've had so far. So, for example, we could look at how the clouds and everything lines up so perfectly and we could say that this is simply unrealistic. It's impossible. Maybe it's a fantasy of him wishing time could stand still. Or maybe it simply is the idea of time standing still. He painted a, a picture of time standing still. But then we could look a little bit closer at the idea of it's a painting of a painting and say, what is on the other side of that canvas? Is there really a tree on the other side of the canvas? Just because the edges line up, we tend to accept what's in the middle. Is that some human nature, possibly, that's being pointed out? That we're so gullible or accepting of things just because they line up around the edges? Perhaps the conclusion should be that this painting is a painting of a lie. A painting of a deception, similar to deceptions that we fall into all the time. For example the media. Does the media tend to trick us? Do they 
make the edges line up, but then fill in the middle with what they want us to believe. There could be anything on the other side. There could be a battle on the other side, but it's being covered up. There could be a robbery on the other side, but it's being covered up. Maybe there's a fallen down uh, shack that destroys how beautiful it is, and he just wants you to see the beauty, so he takes it out. He can alter anything he wants, or she can alter anything she wants in the middle, because she can make the edges line up. So that can be a conclusion about this painting. At this point, we can apply much more thought because we've gone through all the previous steps. Now we're not going to look at all of the paintings and other artwork in the textbook, but we are going to look at a few more. Here's a couple that you've seen. Sandra Botticelli's Portrait of a Young Woman and Frida Kahlo's Portrait of a Necklace and a Hummingbird. Now there's a few things that you need to recognize about these pictures. One, Sandra Botticelli painted a picture of a woman. Frida Kahlo painted a picture of herself. So that understanding will add some meaning. You need to point out or pick out some differences between them. Notice the backgrounds. Notice the clothing. Notice the objects. And determine how those things contribute to how you perceive these women. Some look at these pictures and say, well, one is prettier than the other, or neither is very pretty according to our standards of pretty. Or maybe they look at the background and say, well, one is simple and one is boring, or one, I mean, one is um, simple and boring, or, and one is interesting and, and full of a lot of things to figure out. Um, there's some other things that I want you to consider about the backgrounds. And starting with recognizing who painted each one. The one on the left is painted by Sandra Botticelli, a man. The one on the right is a self-portrait of Frida Kahlo, a woman. So many people consider these to be portrayals of women's uh, inner beauty. Now the one on the left by Sandra Botticelli would be a depiction of a man's image, a man's um, understanding of woman's beauty. Notice the the background is just a solid color. Nothing is there to distract from the woman. Everything about her beauty is her and her alone. So he sees inner beauty as coming from her. The other things are unnecessary. However, the one on the right a woman's portrayal of woman's beauty, she has all kinds of things around her. Animals and nature, things that would describe her, symbols of things that are about her. This is how a woman would portray herself. Now I want you to think about this, especially you girls that are watching this. How would you describe yourself? How would you try to explain to others who you are? And to some degree, you can say simply self-portrait versus someone else introducing you. And we'll look at that some more in just a minute. Um, but notice that she uses things outside of herself. Do you do the same thing? Do you use your interests, your hobbies, the things that you care about to describe who you are? The things, on, the things outside of you create your beauty. So consider this image of beauty related to these two images of the women. Now regardless of man versus woman, look at them as one is being introduced by herself and the other is introduced by someone else. Imagine if you were going to introduce someone else, or maybe not introduce them directly, but tell someone about them. So you know this woman on the left and you want to tell people about her. Perhaps uh, she is very kind, she's very caring, um, she's very patient. Are those things that you would say about yourself? You wouldn't really be very comfortable saying those things about yourself, even if they're true. But you're perfectly comfortable saying those things about someone else. Those are things that we like to use to describe someone else, but not ourselves. On the other hand, when we introduce ourselves, we point out our interests, our hobbies. 
in class, when you're told to introduce yourself, you tell where you're from, how big your family is, what your hobbies are, what you want to do with your life, those kinds of things. You don't tell those qualities, those virtues in yourself. You just tell the outside things about yourself. So is this representative of that same kind of psychology? That when we're introduced by someone else, our virtues are highlighted. But when we're introduced by ourselves, our interests and hobbies and outside things about ourselves are what we highlight. Now I want you to go back and think about these ideas some more, but we're going to keep moving on. This is another painting in your book, and this one sometimes gets a double take. Usually it has a certain response or reaction that's immediate and Students tend to be willing to look at this one a little longer without encouragement from someone else like the others. Um, this is a picture that takes you off guard because it's not the ordinary. Obviously a statement is being made here, so what is it? Here are some ideas to consider. That he is making a statement about each of these things. Now. I'm going to point out a few things, but you will probably have a lot more ideas how this applies and ways that you could um, interpret this yourself according to your own experiences, but consider each of these. What is this painting saying about war? Is war okay? Does the artist appreciate or condemn war? How does the soldier perceive war? How does the child perceive war? How does a family perceive war? How does each uh, participant, whether country or civilian, how does each person perceive war? Or how about power? Who has power and what gives them power? Does the uniform give him power? Does the gun give him power? Has he lost his power because he's given it up to the child? Has she taken it or has he given it? Has he lost power because he's not get holding the gun? Or is he still the one empowered because of his position and he's simply allowing this to happen when he wouldn't have to? Or has the child taken the power, taken charge, taken the gun? And what does she represent? Just a child? A family? A civilian? Someone innocent? Who is she? What is she? Crime. Does it say anything about crime? And consider the word criminal. How would the child perceive a criminal? Would she understand the meaning of soldier, or is the soldier a criminal? Has he committed a crime against her, her family, her friends, her country? Does she perceive the situation the same way he perceives the situation. What does he consider to be a crime? What does he consider to be a criminal? What does he consider his role to be? Security. Security is feeling safe. Does the girl feel safe now? Did she feel safe before? What is what gives her security? Does the soldier with the gun provide her security? Or does it prevent her security? Imperialism. This is other people uh, taking power. How does she perceive imperialism? Does he represent imperialism? And the last one, mass media. This is a little different than the previous ones. Mass media is communication to the masses. Is this mass media? This is not a painting in a museum. This is graffiti. Is it even art? What do you think? Is graffiti art? Is this graffiti art? And is graffiti mass media? Perhaps depending where it is? The masses see this and they understand that a message is being sent. Do they get it? Is that communication being sent to the masses and therefore is this mass media? And one parting thought for you to consider. This is described as a weapon of mass distraction. Not destruction. Distraction. Can art be a weapon? And is it a weapon of mass distraction?